Hello everybody, welcome to 22 minutes and 39 seconds of me pretty much just rambling and pondering life's questions. Um, this will be section 11 and section 12 of the plans. I combined both of them mostly because section 11 here, the empennage uh, tach is relatively quick. I'm going to guess it's about five to six minutes. Uh, here I am... Um, making sure that the jam nuts and rod end bearings are um, correct to the plans and uh, for a quick second there I had the um, angle calculator on it making sure that I had the right degrees of deflection upwards and downwards and then at this point in time it's time to drill for both the middle bearing there and for the uh, push rod hole. Um, I know it says it in the plans um, and I, I think still some people uh, get a little bit confused in that those two white rudder horns are not supposed to be exactly mirror images of themselves uh, with the elevators in trail they will be a little bit offset most likely um, it took me a little bit of going back and forth with Vans, though, to make sure that both of those horns were in the correct position relative to the rear horizontal stabilizer bar. And right there, I was flip flipping around four bolts that I had put in backwards. The head of the bolts needed to be on the aft section, and they were the forward section of that aft spar. Here I'm drilling the hole for the horizontal stabilizer. I got this uh, extension for my drill. It was absolutely horrible. I went on to, uh, it was either Aircraft Spruce or Cleveland Tools and just bought a uh, 12 inch drill bit. Um, and that's absolutely needed. Uh, there's really no way of being able to, to get that completed without that 12 inch drill bit. 12 inch long drill bit. I'm not exactly sure the diameter of that. Uh, and now we're essentially moving on to, well, I thought we were moving on to 12. Yes, we are. Moving on to step 12, or section 12, the fairings and the god awful amount of time it is to put the fairings on. I guess one small step back to 11 there, putting the vertical and uh, rudder on. There is one washer that is put, I believe it's the top right aft spar of the rudder that uh, you'll have to be careful of. It essentially helps counteract the twist that is... Um, on the rudder there and Van specifically wants a twist on that rudder it's even built into the spars or so they say but yeah so anyways moving on from that we'll get into the fiberglass I left the fiberglass I did the footage for the fiberglass even though this really kind of is my first introduction to fiberglass and it is a um, pretty terrifying ordeal to start out with and then you just kind of start to get used to it I rebuilt a transom to a boat about 10 years ago and now after doing that I can see that even in rebuilding that transom I must have made all kinds of mistakes um, here you can see that's going to just be the glass beads that um, are mixed with um, the resin. And uh, it's the West Coast Systems resin that I'm using and I'm pretty happy with it. I don't really have any other uh, familiarization with any other types of resins but uh, that's what also Vans recommends so that's I just went right with them you can see there on that 
the the bottom rudder fairing there it's already been trimmed for the center line the center line when they come to you they're essentially two shelves that have been glued together and those center lines really need to be ground down um, it took me a little while to figure out that that was just part of the manufacturing process because the plans do not say anywhere in there that that is indeed what you need to do um, it kind of would have been nice to have that little note since they pretty much know everybody is unfamiliar with fiberglass but alas they did not so then moving on it uh, it has you essentially calculate where you want the uh, holes you match drill them just kinda like you would any other aluminum part and there's more fiberglass beads mixed with resin the uh, the very last couple of holes there those are particularly tough um, I was using a pop rivet close quarters dimple die from Cleveland it's the only product from Cleveland tools where I've said it wasn't manufactured as well as it could have been uh, they come with um, copper um, posts to essentially use the squeezer on and those copper posts almost always shear off before it even imparts the dimple. Um, I went back and I bought a pneumatic pop riveter from Aircraft Tool Supply and they sent close quarter pop rivet dies as part of a package. It was kind of like a sale so I doubt you could find it now but the close quarter pop dimple set that Aircraft Tools Supply sells comes with a very heavy duty uh, steel post that you put in the middle and I've yet to have that snap and I can put a good amount of force onto my pop riveter and actually impart a dimple. I highly suggest the one from Aircraft Tools uh, Cleveland Tools, it's the only one, it's the only tool I've received from Cleveland Tools, and most of my tools are from them. It's the only tool where I say, yeah, it's probably should have skipped that one. Hopefully they'll, they'll run across aircraft tools sometime and figure out how they're doing those steel posts. Uh, here you can see me um, on every single fiberglass part. Um, I made essentially a... Uh, aluminum strip that I bonded inside of the fiberglass part because I didn't particularly like the idea of drilling a hole sticking a pop rivet down in there and squeezing the pop rivet with it only having the fiberglass part to grab onto um, to me just fiberglass is too brittle for that I'm I know there's probably hundreds if not thousands of 14s well not thousands because they're only on their like thousandth builder now but um, I know that there's tons of RVs out there that fly just fine with just the fiberglass fairing pop riveted and it doesn't have an aluminum um, strip essentially epoxied internally uh, but for me I just felt like it was a much better option and right here you can see on the vertical stabilizer I'm redoing um, I'm going off plans and I am putting uh, four nut plates on either side of this vertical stabilizer shell so that I can eventually mount a camera and so therefore I had to dimple the vertical stabilizer I had to countersink the vertical stabilizer fairing in order to accept those um, screws and then I also had to install nut plates and I did that um, again aluminum strip inside the fiberglass fairing first and then install the nut plates this is the very start of the work this is before I've really done much of anything I'm just floxing the nose right there where my finger is pointing and I didn't use micro beads because I didn't feel like it was it was gonna stand up this is the aluminum strip and I'm starting to drill for nut plates right here 
Um, so this is uh, the aluminum strip has been bonded and I'm just starting to drill the nut plates at this point in time and then on the next image you'll see that uh, you'll see the way that I've done the nut plate is essentially I've put a screw in one nut plate cut the head of the screw off so that it fits within the hole and that's the way that I determine where to drill the holes for the nut plate and this is from Build Fly Go, um, Gil Barros. Uh, this was his idea. I want to be very clear about this. And he said that I could share the image. But to make a plate that then accepts those screws to where then you can turn around and uh, mount the camera is the same idea that uh, I'm going to go with here. I've seen many of his videos. If you haven't seen his videos, definitely go check it out. It's Build Fly Go on YouTube and uh, especially the ones to uh, to Brazil um, he used that camera pretty extensively and it was pretty incredible so thank you Gil for the video that you posted to that I will try to link that video so that everybody can uh, can see both uh, can see that that video where he explains his camera and how he did that pretty smart stuff and so that also leads me to I've run a singular power cable up from the uh, essentially the aft baggage area up through the tail so that that camera will have a positive power wire and won't rely on batteries which would surely die halfway through the flight so um, you can see, kind of tell, maybe, on the nose there that it's been floxed and then uh, I used some micro beads to uh, kind of fill in a few areas where um, it didn't really need anything structural but just needed a little bit of filler. The horizontal stabilizer and the elevators, um, especially as you can see the nose of that elevator, takes a lot of uh, micro beads to kind of round out from the um, counterbalance skin to the fiberglass fairing. It was a good amount of uh, micro beads and it was a lot of sanding. Uh, here it looks like I am just creating oh yes so I've essentially made two pieces of flat aluminum. I've angled them ever so slightly so that they fit into the horizontal stabilizer nose and uh, essentially just wait for those two flat pieces to dry and then bond them to the horizontal stabilizer nose. I do apologize, it's a lot of back and forth mostly because you do one thing and then you're waiting a day for it to dry so if you if you're waiting on one thing to dry you just kind of bounce around from what has dried and what hasn't dried at this current time I'm just using uh, micro balloons to fill in areas of the fiberglass fairings on the elevators there and while we're at it, I know that a lot of people uh, like to just glass over from the fiberglass fairing to the elevator. I chose not to do that. I just essentially did uh, micro bead filler and had it contour the aluminum. Um, I Something about the idea of putting fiberglass from the fiberglass fairing to the aluminum skin just I was not overly excited to do and it's I mean it's two different structures um, it seemed like it had a lot of potential for cracking whereas if I'm just pop riveting these fiberglass fairings on and they're blended to the point where they are flush with the aluminum on the other side that has a lot less potential for cracking. Uh, I'm 
wish I could have made it to Oshkosh this year. I was going to, and then a lot of different things came up. So I wasn't able to, but the one thing I wanted to go around and look at if I, in uh, Oshkosh is whether or not those that glassed from the fiberglass fairing onto the elevator, onto the horizontal stabilizer, et cetera, et cetera, if there were any signs of cracking. I'm going to guess probably not because if you sandpaper the heck out of the aluminum skin, it should adhere well enough, especially with enough uh, prep. But uh, I just hedged my bets and said, oh, I won't do that, and there will be a lot less potential for cracking, especially since this is kind of my first step into fiberglass. Maybe there will be another plane. Maybe I'll do it differently next time. Hopefully it will be a 10 next time. But... Uh, yeah, so anyways, I know a lot of people use uh, die grinders and whatnot, but I found that the belt sander is one of the best ways for me to essentially get a rough cut down to what I need. There's a lot of places where you need to trim the sections that meet up with the aluminum skin, so I found that was the quickest way to do that. Here's a here's a foam plug that essentially I put in to make sure that the um, that it stayed the correct angle, and then I used a, um, a vise to essentially make that bend. This is the final product of the vertical stabilizer to I'm sorry the horizontal stabilizer to the elevator arm. I'm pretty happy with the way that those came out. My rudder it, they say that there needs to be one eighth. My rudder was more or less three sixteenths. And I found that just taking a rod end bearing and doing half a turn and then returning, retightening the jam nut got me to my one eighth that I needed. Even though the rudder was within the tolerances of the rod end bearing, just needed half a turn out to where then I had enough spacing between the two fiberglass fairings. Uh, here at the bottom, I'm doing the aluminum, uh, essentially fascia covering, I guess you could say. Uh, lots of taking on and off to make sure that it meets up with the bottom skin of the horizontal stabilizer there. That was a lot of work. Um, it's just, and it wasn't really work per se, it was just minute details of how much further things need to be cut down. Uh, this will be, this here will be the final painting of all of the, um, fiberglass fairings and I'm gonna go have some pictures that go back and show you how I got to this stage um, because there wasn't a lot of video on that and uh, I'm using the Stuart system uh, eco coat I really like it except for the fact that I'm like the world's worst painter ever and I always get orange peel um, so this is the Bondo glazing and spot putty that's what I use to fill any dimples in the micro beads and you can see me just using a blade knife to essentially start a flat coat of that it dries nice um, you can see you can see where the microfiller is and then of course the darker red is just that bondo making sure to have a nice smooth finish and then of course the inevitable orange peel that I got uh, and so Stuart system says to paint the products between uh, 70 and 90 degrees I was 8 degrees over um, I don't feel like that was the reason for the orange peel. Finally, um, they they also say that you can dilute by 10% distilled water, and I did that. I used uh, I was using a 1.8 nozzle without it diluted, and then I went to the 1.4 nozzle with it diluted, which is exactly what they say to do. Something for whatever reason. Um, it, it required a little bit more high pressure than what I am used to painting and um, everything seemed to smooth out correctly after that. Uh, I have no doubt that it was all user error and in no part part of the Stuart Systems paint. Um, But yeah, one of these days I need to just take a class on HVLP guns and how to paint things. That white van in the background was painted by me and an HVLP gun and probably 30% of it is all orange peel. 
Um, so this is pretty much wrapping up to the final conclusion of the empennage. Uh, for the most part, everything is complete. I cannot remember exactly why I have that last elevator off. I will say one of the tougher parts was um, it was just more time consuming was making the aluminum strips and then adhering them to um, to the fiberglass. I found that uh, resin really wasn't doing it. Uh, I went with a two part epoxy that you would get from Home Depot and that finally did it. So uh, the the resin just would not have a glue like hold and every time I would go to drill a hole I would essentially just push the aluminum piece right off the fiberglass piece and break the bond so if you're gonna do the aluminum strip thing like I did you're definitely gonna want to do a two-part epoxy uh, right there I was just drilling tapping the uh, the thread for the um, bottom light there and then towards the end here you'll see I just start using the pneumatic pop riveter that I got from uh, aircraft tool supply to essentially finish up all of the to pop rivet all of the fiberglass pieces on I think I'm still at this point I'm still at least three or four months away from receiving my wing kit so that's why I went on ahead and did the, all the fiberglass pieces and I'm very glad that I had that amount of time to do the fiberglass pieces because a lot of people leave them for the last thing and that's not wrong but they are incredibly time consuming and uh, yeah this is pretty much the the end here once you pop rivet there's really no going back so make sure it's exactly the way you want it and now for the fun part of trying to figure out where I'm gonna store all this stuff hope uh, everybody enjoyed the video and I'll see you on the next one